Support for another round comes from Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com today for a domain experience that's transparent and easy to set up. Just make sure you enter offer code another round at checkout to get 10% off. Make your next move with Squarespace. Hey everyone, Eleanor from the Pod Squad here. I just wanted to share with you some very exciting news, and that is that Another Round is having a live show in Chicago, and we want to see you there. Join us on June 21st at Thalia Hall for a live taping of the podcast. It's going to be amazing. It's part of WBEZ's Podcast Passport series. And tickets go on sale on Friday, May 5th. And for more information, go to wbez.org slash events. Hey, everybody, it's Tracy, and you are listening to Another Round with Heaven and Tracy. And guess what? You get another All-Stars episode. Yay! Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. Today's All-Star episode is all about books. Books, books, books. Reading, reading, reading. Reading is fun. I should read more. I don't read, I don't read a lot. You know, today I said to myself that the only New Year's resolution I'm going to make is to read more. But as I think about it, I think that was my resolution last year. (laughs) So maybe it shouldn't be my resolution again this year. I don't know. So today we're going to highlight some of the best conversations that we have had so far about reading and writing. And I'm so excited because, as I said earlier, it's not something that I do like I should. And listening to people who actually read and even more listening to people who write really make me excited about reading. So maybe this will be the thing that will make my New Year's resolution actually stick in 2017. We got lots and lots of sage advice from a lot of talented people and some of your favorite, favorite writers, including, but not limited to, Miss Roxane Gay, ta Coates, the first lady of NYC, Miss Shirley McRae, just to name a few. So first up, we're going to revisit the struggle that brown people and girls know all too well growing up, and that is reading stories exclusively about white boys and their dogs. We had our writer and friend and my neighbor, fun fact, she lives upstairs in my very own building, Ashley C. Ford, and the amazing and talented and super, super smart 11-year-old Marley Diaz of 1,000 Black Girl Books on the show. And if you are not aware, 1,000 Black Girl Books is a campaign that donates books with black girl characters to schools because, as we said earlier, there are other stories out there that exist without white boys and their dogs. And this was a campaign that um, Marley started all by herself. I don't know what you were doing when you were 11, but I was not starting (laughs) national campaigns. Um, But I wish somebody had because it would have been really, really helpful to me as a kid reading about other stuff besides white boys and their dogs. If you are a white boy who is listening or a dog, no hard feelings. It's just, we we get it, okay? (laughs) We just get it. Okay, so Marley and Ashley, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the books that we love. And we're going to do this in round table style. So we'll ask one question and then we'll each go around and answer it. Cool? Okie dokie. Okie dokie, artichokey. Marley, what is the book that most influenced you growing up? Well, I'm still growing up. True. But <laughs> there's, okay, so there's, there's two. Okay. One that's very ironic that no one really expected that would influence me that I think is funny. And the second one that definitely shaped me the most. So the one that shaped me the most I'll do first. So that was Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. And I'm a very, very avid reader. Like, I read a lot. I can comprehend. I do read fast. I mm. mean, it's gotten slower in my reading because I read thicker books that take harder to understand. But, like, mm-hmm. I've always been able to finish a book, understand it, write something about it, and then be done. Mm-hmm. And then this book I got for my ninth birthday, yeah, ninth birthday by uh, from my TT, my aunt. Mm-hmm. And she said, okay, read this. This reminds me of you. So I, I started to read it. I didn't understand. I didn't know what to do because I <laughs> never just not understood like, <laughs> at all. Like I have no clue what she's trying to say. I have no clue what this means. And I just shut it up. I just pushed it aside and forgot about it until the next year when my TD come my so my TD comes back and she says, "How is the book?" Mm-hmm. And I say, "I didn't I didn't even finish it because I didn't understand." And she said, "Maybe you should try again." So I did because I normally never even get to the step of try again. It's not even like <laughs> like in the saying like in the Bam. saying it's like if you fail. Try again. Like, I'm not even at the if part. I'm not even at the space before that. <laughs> After this, before this moment. So, I'm already failed, and I haven't even admitted to that. I just think that, whatever, I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm not computing the fact that I, I'm having trouble. And so, 
And then I realized that, and I read the book, and I'm still kind of frustrated that I didn't understand it. And then I realized that I do get it now, and it made me so happy. Mm. I was like, oh, yay. <laughs> that happened, and I read it, and then I, fu- I understood, I was like, why am I not seeing this in school? Mm. Why is no one else telling me about these books? Why did my aunt have to go on Amazon and look for books about black girls mm-hmm. instead of being able to go and find one herself? Mm-hmm. It just all hit me at once. Like, why is this not anywhere? Mm-hmm. So, and then I went to my class and I saw it not in my fifth grade class. And that's how the project started. And then this, the, the first book that I read that actually influenced me, but it was really funny, is that it's a book called Croc on the Rock. It's like <laughs> a very simple book. And you'll never guess who the main character is. Is it a crocodile? Nope. What? It's a white boy and a dog. (laughs) And it's one of the first books I have ever read by myself. Oh, my god! Which is hilarious. (laughs) And I love that book, and I still have it at my house now. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny. Now that the project just started, and I went through my bookshelf, like, what books do I have when we started? And I realized, why is Croc on the Rock here? (laughs) Like, it doesn't belong here. (laughs) And then I I showed it to my mom, and she was like, well, this is one of the first books you ever read. And I was like, but but why? But why did we pick this one? Like, we should have maybe thought about that. But it, it did teach me how to read, and it, it expanded my vocabulary, and it taught me how to talk, talk in full, complete sentences. So mm-hmm. it did help me become more articulate. But at the same time, it was against what my project is about. <laughs> we all got to start somewhere. That's okay. We do. Ashley, what about you? The book that influenced you most growing up? I, I mean, I'm the same as Marley. I have two and the first one is Amazing Grace. And that influenced me for weird reasons. I mean, good reasons. First being that the the little girl, um, Grace, who is the protagonist of the book, is a performer or wants to be a performer. And she really loves playing pretend. And for most of my life, I wanted to be an actress, like probably up until I went to college. And a friend of mine wanted to be an actor as well. And ended up living in California, living in his car. And I was like, I don't think I love acting that much. (laughs) So (laughs) I was trying to think of something I did love that much. But I loved the book because, you know, part of it is that this little black girl is told that she can't play Peter Pan because she's black and then also because she's a girl. Mm. And, you know, spoiler alert, in the end, she not only does she get the role of Peter Pan, but she blows everybody away. Mm. And so I loved that. Also, um, my fifth, my um, kindergarten picture and the picture of Grace look almost identical. Aww. And so for a long, and my father is an artist. Um, so for a long time, I thought that like my father had drawn the oh book my for gosh. me. Um, so that's like a weird one that I loved. And then the book Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech oh. had a really huge effect on me. I actually reread it almost every year. Uh, because it's it to I, it honestly is to me one of the most poignant books about women and about grief that I've ever read in my entire life mm. to this point. That sounds amazing. It does. Mm-hmm. Evan, what about you? I read a lot of books with young girls who were like inquisitive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so you know, you're Harriet the Spies. Yeah. <laughs> I read a lot of Encyclopedia Brown. I thought I was Encyclopedia Brown. I am Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Brown. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think of those, the one, and of course your Judy Blooms. Oh, yeah. Judy the God. (laughs) Yes. I think the one that influenced me the most was Matilda. Oh, I love Matilda. I love Matilda. Matilda. It really captured for me. There are other girls out there, too, who are just stowing away in their books because the outside world's not that great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Also, I just wanted secret powers to finally come in. <laughs> so when are my secret powers coming in? <laughs> so that was, yeah, I think that one was the one that made me, that like best describes my relationship to books as a kid. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it was Charlotte's Web. Ooh. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, because I mean, it's really the first book that I ever fell in love with, like could not stop reading it, could not put it down. Also, it was just like a really pretty world that somebody else created. And yeah. I was just like, yo, you can you can just, anybody can do this. Like, I can think of a world where, like, spiders talk and stuff. And, like, yeah. I just felt so, like. I mean, you loved animals. So yeah. You, you had yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It's I was crazy. so it into sense. it. I was so into it. But I think that's the first time where I was like, okay, I want to do this. 
like I want to write a book one day that makes somebody feel the way that this book has made me feel. And it's mm. like been on my list of favorite books since the second grade. Aww. Shout out to Charlotte, girl. Charlotte, that was my heart. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. Oh, spoiler my alert. My bad, my bad. Wow. You could, you could just edit wow. that out. <laughs> but also R.I.P. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, stop. I know. Um, Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> Why you sound nervous? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> what? What world of a book would you most want to live in, oh and why? God. Marley's got her answer already. Oh Sorry, I had goodness. this question earlier, and I love my answer so much. Oh, <laughs> I'm just like, go first though. Go oh, first. yeah, go but first. hurry up! You... I want to get some. Go first. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> oh man. Oh, this is such a hard question because I'm like I'm so obsessed with Harry Potter. And I can't imagine not wanting to have gone to Hogwarts and but I know I would have been in Dumbledore's army and I would have, you know, like that battle was mm -hmm. terrible. But I think like I, there's something about being on the side of good and like fighting for the greater good and things like that. Like, don't get me wrong. I have no desire to go to war. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying Noted. to go to war. <laughs> but, I, you know... I like fantastical things and I love whimsy mm -hmm. and I just can't imagine that that wouldn't be a wonderful place for me to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Marley, your turn. Okay. So mine is kind of ridiculous, but yes, it's I love awesome. It so I picked like the world that Charlie Brown lives in, Ooh. but I picked this for a really funny reason because like Charlie Brown is amazed by everything. <laughs> so like, it, so because his whole life has been portrayed through these comics and this movie and this book, I mean, and these books and like every, everywhere, basically. <laughs> If I were to go to his, his world and tell him everything about him, he would be so amazed by me. <laughs> I, would become, I would become like the queen of wherever they live, and that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Because would you be awesome. would know everything yeah. about them. And it you wouldn't would. be kind of, it wouldn't be that creepy to them because they're all going to stay kids. They all yeah. stay kids <laughs> forever. <laughs> but to adults, that would have been like, wow, restraining order. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. Oh my God, <laughs> Kevin! What about you? <laughs> That's such an amazing answer. <laughs> I can't top that. <laughs> I think I have to agree with Ashley. I think mine is Harry Potter too. Uh huh. I think it was just if you're a part of the Harry Potter generation, like I was. I remember I was in third grade when the third book came out, and I had a teacher named Miss Chambers, and or it was the second book. Mm -hmm. Chamber of Secrets. Oh. <laughs> and we made horrible jokes about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just such a big part. If you grew up while that was like playing out that whole seven elegy, oh, <laughs> all, seven all of them, elegy. you know, uh -huh. it was so exciting. I totally wanted to go to Hogwarts. Yeah. Like, I You're a Ravenclaw. Oh my God, I feel insulted. Really? What? Ravenclaw? You don't think you're a Ravenclaw? What is it about me that suggests Ravenclaw? Um, the fact that you got the charger in the phone, and you took off your glasses for the headphones because you want to preserve the glasses. To me, the glasses, meh. But <laughs> interesting evidence. But you got your legs crossed. <laughs> Very research based. You're, you see. Oh my god! I feel like this, I'm being you're wearing red. a college jersey. <laughs> Yeah. Your laptop has multiple analysis. tabs open. Oh man! <laughs> See? <laughs> See? See, you're Ravenclaw. Yo, you know I've not I read. I, just, I think I just have to accept this. <laughs> I have not read one Harry Potter book. So I don't even know what's going on. Okay, this so is like, very Gryffindor enjoyable is like the me. leader. Like, yo, bro. Okay. And Ravenclaw is like, hello. <laughs> Would you like to discuss the plaguing issues of society? <laughs> Wow, we go. <laughs> wow, we go play cricket. <laughs> and a Hufflepuff is like, bro, have you ever seen inside your soul? I can look for your soul. Wait, is that That's me? Yep, crazy. you're a Hufflepuff. You're a Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. And then I'm Slytherin a is like, Marley's making a face. <laughs> a stink face. Yeah, yeah. it's like really. Oh, yeah. I, said, I feel like I'm Slytherin and Ravenclaw. Yeah, yeah. you can be both. That's like yeah. the most common. Perfect. But I'm a I'm a Hucklebuck. What is it <laughs> Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff, <laughs> Hufflepuff. They're like honey. They're like thing is a honey badger and like Gryffindors yes. is a Griffin and honey Ravenclaw is a dope. Raven and then Slytherin is a snake. Huh. Okay. I feel All like right. I've learned so much about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the Hucklebuck. Straight Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hearing Marley and Ashley talk about seeing themselves represented in books for the first time inspired us to call up a bunch of our favorite, favorite book people and ask them the same question. When is the first time you felt represented in the literature that you consume? So first, let's hear from Lisa Lucas. Lisa is the head of the National Book Foundation, which is in charge of the National Book Awards, which happened just two short weeks ago. Shout out to Jacqueline Woodson, who was one of the finalists in this year's fiction category. Yay! We're going to have her on later in the show. But first, let's hear from Lisa. I always saw some part of myself reflected back in literature. You're a little kid and you have your first crush and you read Sweet Valley High and you see yourself reflected back in the silly, you know, youthful, crushing and, and you know, first burgeoning understanding of desire um, in like a youthful kind of way. So you see yourself there. Um, I saw myself in... You know, some of the things that I was assigned at school, or you read Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Brook Sings, and you think about, you know, yourself as a young black woman in the United States, and, and you see some piece of yourself. But I, you know, I grew up um, in a really suburban town. I went to a school where I was one of very few people of color as a young person um, all the way through middle school. Um, and I don't know. I lived in this kind of, like, weird, multicultural you know, universe that I didn't always see reflected back. Um, I saw s- political stories. I saw historical stories. I saw stories that I totally related to but didn't feature characters that looked like me. Um, but I don't know that there was one thing where it was just like, uh-huh, this book, this book showed me me in a way that I couldn't see looking in the mirror. Um, the first time, though, I, and I always tell the story, the first time that I really um, saw something, some glimmer of who I was reflected back was when I read White Teeth by Zadie Smith. And it's funny, right, because she's a woman who lived across an ocean in another country who was writing about a totally different reality. But it sort of um, it reflected back, you know, the fact that you don't have to look at race or a life in a traditional boxed-in way. You can write a story about people that live all kinds of wacky lives, and they can be brown, and they can be, you know, they can be anything. And I really, I think I became a reader when I read that book. I remember I was just out of college. I must have been 21, and I bought it at the bookstore, you know, near my neighborhood where I was living in Chicago back then. And uh, and I tore through it, and I thought, oh, my God, i got to go you know, I wanted to talk to everybody about it. I needed to go back to the bookstore and find something else. And it just, like, got me excited. It, it, it really was like I had just come off of, you know, God knows how many years of school. And most of the reading that you do is prescribed. And it made me, like, an autonomous reader. Um, I felt like there was, as an adult, real choice there. Um, and it was because I saw something that reminded me of me in that book. And it was an important moment and an important book for me. And again, if you if I were to read it again today, and I mean to reread that book, I haven't in a while. Um, I wonder how much of myself I'll really see reflected back. I, but I think it just I was so frustrated by not seeing, you know, people who went to the same kind of school for college or that you know had interracial families um, in the work that I was reading. So that was exciting. I think also. It was probably in college that I came across Baldwin. And I think for me, that was like just my first encounter with the kind of real talk I was looking for. There was intelligence and rage and um, a real lack of being willing to concede a point that was a fair point. Um, And that was exciting. You know, I think about... um, the fire next time and the letter that he writes to his nephew and he's just saying we are celebrating emancipation a hundred years too soon because you know and I know that we're not free and that for me was like yeah see (laughs) we're not it's like it doesn't matter how smart I am it doesn't matter what I do I'm still not free and um, and then I think there was a biography called Wrapped in Rainbows of Zora Neale Hurston and so I'd read Zora Neale Hurston, and I loved her work. And again, you know, sort of in that broad sense of relating to stories about black lives, um, I related to it. But reading her biography where she was just this complicated, you know, 
totally um she was uncompromising she was totally weird she marched to the beat of her own drummer she was a, an anthropologist and a novelist and an unreliable narrator of her own life she looked like she liked to drink she looked like a lot of fun and she was smart as all get out and i just thought man not necessarily i am like her but i would like to be like her uh i saw like a hero in that and i think reading about her life was important for me Growing up, you know, there were lots of black voices. There have always been lots of black voices. Or, or there have always been a number of black voices that are excellent, that are telling incredible stories, that are moving, and that speak to, you know, the, the way that black lives are lived in the United States. Um, but sometimes I feel like as, like, you know, in my 20s, like a black girl dating, hanging out, getting in trouble, suffering horrible hangovers or whatever you did when you were in your 20s. Like, there wasn't, like, a book for that, you know. And I think that I was a natural reader. I was a born reader. I grew up with books. I, you know, I just gravitated that way. Uh, I studied English in college. But for somebody who doesn't, that's the entry point, you know. And so maybe there is a book that actually does reflect some of that. And the key is to help that potential reader find that book and then say you have an invitation come on you know there's stuff for you too maybe it's not the stuff that's getting the most press maybe it's not um, what's facing outward at your local bookstore maybe it's not what you hear about or think about when we talk about literature but it's there and so one I can encourage more of that writing to be written and join the chorus of voices that are asking for it I'm but one voice in that conversation but I can also direct people to it when it happens. Uh, you know, one of your colleagues, Saeed Jones, um, you know, wrote this incredible collection of poetry. And he's, he's you know, his voice is so um, contemporary and queer and beautiful and angry. And um, if I went into a grocery store, I said to, you know, somebody who looked like they might be interested in poetry. And I said, do you know Saeed Jones? They might not. But it's like, but if I can explain it and I can say, look, this is a piece of work that you should really be excited by, they're going to maybe pick it up. So I think that there's two, two pieces to it. I think that we need to make sure that we are allowing for the work to be written um, and creating channels for that work to be written. And that's not what I do. I, I celebrate work that's already out for the most part. And then once it's out, we've got to stand on top of tables and shout that it's there and that we're here. And that there's something for us. You know, that Solange song that just came out, you know, for us, by us. Um, it's real. Sometimes there is stuff for us. And we have, to, we have to be loud about it. We have to acknowledge it. And we have to share it. And we have to pass it along to our friends. And, and I think that, um, you know, from, from, from our perch at the foundation, you know, we can, we can do that for a lot of different types of voices and a lot of different types of books. And that's the hope. My name is Saeed Jones. I'm the executive editor of Culture. I've always been a passionate reader. Um, I loved going to the library and reading books uh, on my own. And it was very important for me to be able to find books on my own. Um, I, I was that student who, I would read what was assigned in class, but it was, I, would, I was more passionate if I felt that I had made a discovery. Um, and, and in terms of like kind of, when I started to see myself in books, it, it was a long time, you know, because um, you know I grew up in in the suburbs of North Texas, and um, I'm, I'm gay. I was raised Buddhist. Um, I'm obviously African American, you know, and so that self is not going to be in a book until I write it, right? Which is what I'm doing now. But so you so you see yourself in in shards, you know, and. Um, 
And so I, I would read books, you know, like Giovanni's Room. I remember when I read that, I was like, oh my goodness, James Baldwin. Like, I know it's a novel, but this does not feel like fiction. But of course, all of the characters in that book are white. So, right, you're getting to see masculinity and queerness, but it, it, it's a white European American experience. Um, but when I finally found Zamia and New Spelling of My Name by Audre Lorde, it, it was the first time that I was able to see in, in, in the nonfiction memoir form a Black queer artist, um, poet, um, lover, you know, really making her way through the world. And, and you know, much of it is set in, in New York City, and I've always wanted to live in New York City. And um, and and some people will say, oh, but it's a woman. But you know, I grew up around women. I grew up around powerful women. They were always um, the people in my family and my community that I looked to. So in that way, it, it did feel like seeing myself when I, I was reading about her her experiences in that book. I used to go to the library and find books about gay or queer experiences, you know, where, whatever they, I could in the in the gay section. It was like homosexual studies in the library. And I would pull them onto my lap and I would sit on the floor cross-legged. And then I would get like a history book to hide it in case anyone came near me, you know? And, that, and that, that was me like well through high school. That was my experience trying to find myself in books. And I would like to believe, you know, no one has to do that anymore. My name is Jacqueline Woodson, and I am an author. Um, some of my recent books include Another Brooklyn, Brown Girl Dreaming, Each Kindness, and Locomotion. I write for children and very young children and adults. So the earliest memory was a book called Stevie by John Steptoe. And it was the first time um, I read a book where not only did the people look like me, but they were speaking, they lived in the city. I was living in Brooklyn. They spoke in a dialect. Um, you know, um, I know one line is, you know, his mama kept calling him Stevie, but his real name was Steven. My mama, my name is Robert, but my mama don't call me Roberty. And And just kind of hearing the double negatives and all of that language that was very deeply familiar to me was this kind of moment where I, I thought, wow, I can do this. I can tell these stories about people who look like me. And then, of course, Eloise Greenfield um, was an, uh, a poet from my childhood who really spoke to me as a writer. And then later on, Virginia Hamilton and James Baldwin and the other people. But it was not until um, I read Stevie that I had been, wanted to be a writer for a long time, at, you know, from a very, very young age. But I didn't see myself in so many of the books we were reading in my classroom. Um, even the books that my mother, that we got out of the library, didn't always represent us or didn't represent us positively. Um, or the books that were getting awards and therefore getting into our classroom were oftentimes problematic. And I remember as a young person, the first time I read Mildred Taylor's Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, and loving loving, loving that book and just rereading it and, you know, carrying it around until it was tattered because it was suddenly a whole family of my people. Um, so I've definitely had different moments where I've had an awakening and um, and a place, a point where I felt legitimized, not only as a human being, but as a writer. Hi, I'm Britt Bennett, and I'm the author of The Mothers. I mean, honestly, like a, a moment when this happened was very recent. It was when I read The Turner House um, by Angela Flournoy. And that book came out last year. And I remember that was one of the first books I read that uh, followed a middle class black family um, that was having these struggles. Um, but it wasn't the sort of glorified struggle of that, we, that we're used to seeing um, often in, in narratives about black families. Um, that was a moment where I remember reading it and just thinking like these characters are just regular people, just regular black people having problems. Um, it's a contemporary novel and it's something that's happening now. Um, it's not sort of this epic historic um, book that we often, I think, see for for fiction um, with black characters. Um, so that was a moment that happened very recent where I remember feeling feeling very represented. I think thinking back um, when I was younger, I remember The Color Purple was just a book that was super important to me. It wasn't something that I necessarily related to a lot, but I think it's a book that really represents the ways in which racism affects the lives of black women and sexism affects the lives of black women. 
the ways in which those things overlap and they're interconnected, and also the ways that black women can, can lift up each other and support each other. Um, so that was a huge book for me when I was a kid. Hi, my name is Brandy Colbert. I am the author of the young adult novel Point and the forthcoming young adult novel Little and Lion, which will be published by Little Brown in August 2017. Um, I was trying to think back to the first time I saw myself reflected in literature, and I really think it was in Iggy's House by Judy Bloom. Um, I grew up in the 80s, and when I was seven years old, my family moved across town um, to an, a street with you know all white neighbors, and we were the first and only black family to live on that street. And it was really interesting and not always great experience and Iggy's house is about the same thing but it's told from the perspective of a white character but I really related to the things that the black family was going through you know for better or worse Um, but then I think the first time I actually really saw myself was in a college literature class I took on women's lit and we read Sula by Toni Morrison and I couldn't believe that I hadn't read anything by Toni Morrison by that point, but I was so glad to be introduced to it then. Um, Sula was just a gorgeous story. It's still one of my favorite books, and it just really had a realistic, wonderful portrayal of black women that I just think is it's just wonderful. I just love it. I can't say enough great things about it. Uh, and then, of course, I went on to read Everything by Toni Morrison. Hello, my name is Shirlaine McRae, and I'm the First Lady of New York City. I'm a writer and poet and a passionate advocate for the underserved. When I think about the first time I saw myself reflected in literature, I I always think about Toni Morrison's book, uh, The Bluest Eye. Uh, The character, Picola Breedlove, um, not a healthy person, but she's an 11-year-old girl who's being ridiculed by by her classmates and, and, and so many others. And, and it was the first time that I read a book that there was a little girl uh, who had experiences, some experiences like mine, and it really moved me. And the fact that there really aren't very many other books like that in literature uh, shows us that we still need more books to reflect the peoples and the experiences of our nation. Hi, my name is Glory, and I'm the founder of Well Read Black Girl, which is a digital platform and an in real life book club based in Brooklyn, New York. There's so many books where you don't see yourself, and I read a lot of Little Women and a lot of Babysitter's Club, and then the moment I read The Color Purple, I was like, we don't have to be perfect, we don't have to like look beautiful, and I feel like there's a lot of like Seely and Shug in every black woman, you know, like we can be like strong, and we can also be vulnerable, and we can also just like let all these like... I don't even know what the word is, like let all our guards down. And when I read that book, I was just like, oh, this is it. This is it. Like it doesn't have to be this perfect package. We can just be ourselves. Uh, And I just love the voices and then watching the film as well. And me and my college roommate, we like when we were sad in college, we would put on the color purple or we would like quote each other from the book, (laughs) like seriously being like, girl, how do you feel about this? You know, like we would just constantly like that was our thing that we would do. So that definitely was like the book for me that was like the turning point of what literature could be like and what um, black women could sound like in stories. It's like therapy. Like you get to like step into someone else's shoes and live their experiences. And you don't always have to feel things firsthand. Like you don't have, I, I mean, clearly I like was not, see, I, was, I wasn't I was like in Celie's situation, but that's like a real thing that happens to women all the time. Sexual abuse, assault, being victimized, like that happens to women. And it's just, by reading it, it allows me to feel more empathetic and have an understanding. And if I do have, like, come have a friend who's, like, having a uh, issue, I can just, like, understand that through narratives. You know what I mean? Like, that's why it feels so important to just, like, have so many different stories. Like, recently we read Here Comes the Sun by Nicole dennis Ben, And she... I was just so moved by her story. Just being a queer woman in Jamaica and having to deal with homophobia and all these, like... I mean, just violence. In so many scenes of the book, there's, like, violence happening. And you just have a different appreciation of what people are going through and how you can address it and how you can be, like, a, an ally in a way that's, like, real and not just not just on the page. Like, you can take what you, like, read in a book and, like, apply it to your real life and have a different, a better understanding and, have, and just be able to empathize with people's struggles. And that's what, like, 
what happened when we had our book club and we met with her, we were able just to talk to her, like, why did you write this? Like, what were the real life experiences that you had that influenced your writing? You know, and how were you able to be like brave enough to tell the story? You know, like she definitely had some pushback. But then the day it was like so much worth it. It was like worth it for her to be out there and sharing her her truth. Yeah, and I think that's what's so important about literature and books. Like you need it to be able to share your truth and be honest with who you are as a person. And it also lives as like a like a living testimony too. So if if you meet someone who needs who's struggling with something, you could be like, "Hey girl, read this book right here." <laughs> like like it becomes empowerment. You're like, "You need to go to this chapter, underline this line, see this quote." I'm constantly sending like quotes and group texts to my friend like here you go. <laughs> like, you read some bell hooks, here's some Alice Walker, here's some Toni Morrison. And it's just, it's like nourishing and gives you just like the, the ability to just see yourself in a different way and feel empowered, you know? Hi, Tracy. Hi, Heaven. Uh, my name is Jeff Chang, and I'm a super stan for another round. So I'm super happy to be doing this. Um, I am a writer, I'm an author. I have had three books that I've written. Uh, the first is called Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip-Hop Generation, which I guess because of Netflix has become kind of a little thing again. And the second big book I did was called Who We Be, A Cultural History of Race in Post-Civil Rights America. And my latest is a book called We Gonna Be All Right, uh, Notes on Race and Resegregation. And I'm currently working on a project, uh, which is a biography of Bruce Lee. I think the first time that I saw myself represented in literature were these little sort of collections of this comic strip called We Pals um, by a guy named Maury Turner, who was the first black syndicated cartoonist in the U.S. And he created sort of this multicultural peanuts. And he had this one character named George who wasn't Chinese American, but he was Japanese American. But the thing about it was, you know, I grew up in Hawaii and I grew up in this very multiracial society where kids of all these different backgrounds are always playing and getting along. And so for me, you know, at a real young age to discover these collections in the library of Maury Turner's cartoons, uh, this, uh, this African-American cartoonist in Berkeley, and many years later actually became his neighbor, and we got to be really good friends. Um, that was just everything for me. Support for Another Round comes from Squarespace. With Squarespace, you get a unique domain experience that's simple to set up and an all-in-one platform to help you create a beautiful website. Which brings me to a game of Would You Rather Internet Edition. And here is where we invite Tyler Sorensen from BuzzFeed's creative department into the studio to ask me one hard Would You Rather question about the internet. Hi, Tyler. Hey, Tracy. What's up? Not much. I have your question, though, if you want to answer Let's do that. it. Let's do it. Here it is. It's, would you rather your employer see your search history <gasps> or your parents? <gasps> Easy answer. I would rather have my employer see my search history because I can blame it on working for a company as strange as BuzzFeed. Like, oh, I had to look up this very embarrassing thing because I'm researching it for a post. But I would have no excuses for my mom. I mean, I guess it could have been just be like, no, it's for work. So you don't really care who I don't sees care. it? Okay. Show it to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Get your unique domain today at squarespace.com. If you sign up for a year, the domain is completely free, and you can also save 10% off your first purchase with the offer code Another Round, as in the title of the wonderful show that you are listening to right now. Make your <laughs> Make your next move with Squarespace. Hey, everybody. So you just survived probably some very prickly conversations with your family around the Thanksgiving table. Congratulations. You did it. You survived. I'm assuming that you survived if you're listening to this podcast right now. Um, but guess what? There's another holiday coming. Oh, no. So you're going to have to do it all over again. I don't know how soon you can expect a break from all of your awkward family conversations. But hey, guess what? No time soon. But Here's the good news. You're not the only one with a family that really, really loves to have important, contentious conversations over a delicious meal. It's an American tradition, you may even say. So here's what you can do. 
because we love you and because we don't want you to go any crazier than you have to this holiday season, when you get into it with your family, whether it's at a holiday party or maybe uh, Uncle Joe is just like, you know what, it's Christmas dinner, let's just do this right now. Maybe it'll just be like walking down the hallway with your cousin uh, Banana Peel. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I tried to stop myself from saying banana peel, but I was like, rationally, you know what? Somebody might have a cousin banana peel. Here's why I thought that. Because I have an uncle named Bunny Rabbit, <laughs> or maybe he's a cousin. I have an uncle named Hoghead. So I've heard crazier names <laughs> than banana peel. <laughs> this is taking a turn. Here's the point. Whenever you have a stressful conversation with your family around holiday time, here's what you should do. Call us or email us when it goes down and you're like, oh, my God, I have to tell somebody about what just happened and you can't find an actual human to (laughs) look in the face. Then call us and look in your computer or your phone and tell us what happened. And in the next few weeks, me and Heaven are going to select some of your stories and the people who told them to participate in an upcoming call-in show where Heaven and I chat with you, yes, you, about how you navigated this shitstorm that has been many people's holiday season so far. Here's how it's going to work. If you want to call and talk to us, leave a message at the following number. Get your pens and your paper if you are old enough to to remember pens and paper (laughs) or grab your little phone and I don't know the number is 562-448-2899 that is 562-HIT-BUZZ which is adorable (laughs) and tell us in 30 seconds or less preferably less what your holiday conversations with your family were like what did Uncle Junebug say how did Aunt Shirley respond are you okay how did you manage the thing that happened to you what is going on we want to hear all about it we want to help you through it as best we can because in helping you get through your awkward family conversations we help ourselves get through ours as well you can also email us if you choose at another round at buzzfeed.com and when you do don't forget to tell us where you're calling from because everybody loves to rep their city and or state and or township what do they have in Canada townships manners <laughs> Canadian manners nobody knows and let us know how to reach you best so we can get in contact with you if you are chosen to talk about your story on the air so hit us on the bus and good luck thank you so so much to our friends of the show both old and new who dropped in and dropped us a line about the lit that they think as the children would say is lit because lit is both a word on its own and it's also short for literature so Um, It's wordplay, guys. It's wordplay and it's funny. (laughs) The next few clips that we're going to hear are about how reading and writing can help us figure out who we are and how to be in the world, which is not a thing that we are born with an instruction manual for. So shout out to books for that. And also about how becoming visible can be a struggle when you are black or brown or something else. So we want to start really quickly with going back to our conversation with um, a little person that you may know, may have heard about. He's only a best-selling author and MacArthur Genius Grant winner. So you have to, by law, constitutionally refer to him as genius. So here is genius ta Coates talking about his book, Between the World and Me. We talked a lot about the legacy that he wants to leave for his son, the struggle to turn struggle into literature, and all of his favorite books. Listen, I, I'm a writer. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a college principal. I'm not a prophet. I know that other, you know, quote unquote intellectuals who style themselves that way. I do not style myself that way at all. Mm. It's not my job to make people feel good about the world. No more than it's Joan Dinian's job to make people feel good about the world. No more than it was F. Scott Fitzgerald's job to make people feel good about the world. I, I write literature, you know, and the notion that art should be judged by whether it makes you feel good or not. Mm -hmm. Whether it makes you feel good about tomorrow is absurd Mm. and infantile. You mentioned in the book how your grandmother played like a big role in your literacy and your writing skills. My mom. Um, It's Samari's grandmother. Yes, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's it's confusing. (laughs) (laughs) And that whenever you got in trouble at school, she'd make you write about it. Yes, yes. Do you remember what you wrote? Wow. No, but it was always like, like why, what was young Tanahasi writing about? Right. Like, why did you do it? What were you thinking at the time? It, was, it had to be really reflective. That was she's big on that. What mm. do you plan to do differently? What mm. was your responsibility in it? I remember she had this rule that I couldn't mention what anybody else had done. Mm. So the story couldn't begin. You know, um, Tommy and them had said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, none of that, none of that. You know, 
Michael Tate hit me and then I. Uh-huh. Like, you couldn't really do that. It always had to be, mm. I did. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And for C, because she was big on responsibility and taking responsibility. You, you said you do that with your son now. I do, but not, he's old now, so not so much. <laughs> I mean, he's like 15, so yeah, yeah. past that. Yeah, yeah. I so did. I was very intrigued by some of the responses to this work. Mm. One of them was people doing a little finger wagging saying it's too depressing mm. <laughs> which these people need to like i mean go watch a disney movie i mean seriously like, don't, don't read the book then yes don't read the book it's cool it's cool yeah. you, you know read read some uh, harlequin novels or something i mean right. you know what i mean go go read yeah a, i don't know it strikes me as kind of patronizing to tell a black person yeah you should write you're not happy responding things. to this racism well <laughs> <I know. laughs> Sir, but you know, allowed this say response. That but black uh-huh. people say that too. Mm, yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the chief response from black folks. And I think uh, one of the problems is um, there have been a number of writers and intellectuals who have decided that they're not going to stay in this lane mm. and they want to be activists. And so people judge you by that standard. But that's, that's not who I am. I write yeah, things. I think that's it. There's also a certain point you reach in your career as a black writer mm-hmm. where you become everyone's go to black writer. <laughs> yeah. So, therefore, not only must you write, but you must change the nation. Yes. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> Just, you know, in your spare time, Just, if you could. Yes. <laughs> this um, is our rapid fire question segment that is rarely rapid fire called Pew 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 Pew. These are finger guns. <laughs> Because it's a gun and right, I got fire. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I got it. I got okay. it. I'm here. Right. Um, if people had the capacity to know more than one contemporary black writer besides Tanhasi Coates, if it were possible, <laughs> who would you recommend they start reading? Can I? Can we not just do one? Can we do like five? Yeah, several, yes. please. <laughs> okay. Um, if it was just one, I she's I hate being cliche. I would pick Isabel Wilkinson easily. Hmm. I just I don't want to be cliche here, but like Toni Morrison. It's cliche because everybody knows who Toni Morrison is, but it's just, if you don't, like, if you haven't read Toni Morrison, you don't understand American literature right mm. now. Mm. I read um, Americana. Mm. And I know she's not African-American, but that book, good Lord. Mm. What people don't know about me is I'm actually, like, a, a romantic. Aww. I know no one would know that. <laughs> <laughs> In between the world and me, but I, like, love great romantic comedies. Mm. And that book is, like, something that people don't do anymore. And mm. that, it's, like, it's a straight, like... Jane Austen, Edith Wharton, mm. George Eliot, you know what I mean? Old school joint. And I love all, I mean, I love that. I don't say that in any sort of condescending way. I, blo- I blogged about all of those authors. But she flipped it and turned it into this big, like, epic. Mm. You know what I mean? Of, 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 the, of the diaspora. That is mm. an, an, an incredible book. And one of my huge influences is poetry. I got I to gotta name some poets. Yusef Kumanyaka. Um, I would strongly, you know, recommend people reading Yus- Yusef Kumanyaka, who's just an incredible, incredible, incredible poet. Um, well, I can only answer this this uh, uh, personally. And um, the Volia Glyph's book, Out of the House of Bondage, mm. which is all about uh, violence that house mistresses inflicted on uh, enslaved black women, mm. <laughs> is incredible. And it's incredible because it goes against a common stereotype of the house mistress is somehow being milder mm. than the house master. So this idea that, that, you know, which if you think about it, it's almost a little sexist, the idea that women can't dole mm-hmm. out violence mm. right. in the same way. I mean, it's tough to name, like, after James Baldwin, like, like, what do I say, the number one influence on, on, on Between the World and Me, but it's high up there. Mm. It's really, really high up there because the book is so physical, and the book is just all about the body, and it's mm. like, I mean, vicious stuff, like pokers in the eye, you know what mm. I mean? People beating people with, like, you know, cattle whips. I mean, women, too, like, you know what I mean? And it, it really shows you, A, that, like, the capacity of violence is, is human. Mm. You know, it's not mm. gender. It's, it's a human thing you know what i mean um and at the same time that you know like like a system of enslavement corrupts everyone and there's no mild mannered ladyhood Mm. that will exempt you from that and when you see that then you can understand how much violence has really you know you know infiltrated you know the fabric of white supremacy and how key it is Mm -hmm. you know it's it's a great book it's Mm. a great great book more people should read it i'm definitely gonna read it yeah Short, too. Like, I think, like, maybe 200, 250, but you get through it in, like, a week. Mm. It won't be a fun week. So that was Genius, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Once again, that is Genius, capital G, Ta-Nehisi Coates. 
Um, we've heard from him. And so now we're going to turn to Roxane Gay, who is one of my personal favorite, favorite authors. And she teaches us that being able to represent yourself is the ultimate, ultimate goal. Because what's the point of cultivating and earning and owning all of this agency if you can't use it to write like a New York Times bestseller or two? And if you're into it, maybe some erotica. Nobody's here to judge you. I may know somebody who has written erotica in a past life. But that's not what this show is about. So we're going to proceed. Um, if you are a child, this may not be the best thing for you to listen to. So go read a book or go write a book. Hmm? We need your voice in the world. I generally do stick to dick or cock in my writing. I mean, mm. it's, it, you're not there for the that. You're there for like how he uses it. Mm. Right. And so that's where I spend my creative okay. energy. <laughs> what are some like erotica tropes you could like do without? Oh God! Woman is kidnapped. <laughs> oh, falls no. in love with her kidnapper. Uh-uh. Nah. No, um, that. Oh, I always hate unrealistic, like physically unrealistic sex scenes. Like <laughs> to this day, I'll never forget. I read a submission once for an erotica anthology, and a, a man was on a an escalator going up, and he was fucking a woman on the step above him on the escalator. <gasps> you are lying. Think about it. Can I read this? <laughs> and <laughs> where can I find this? He's right, his his dick would have had to been this long. <laughs> we were just shown the entire length of Roxanne Kay's arm, which Woo! which sounds very uncomfortable. <laughs> it right, depends on how I use it. Girl, I'm a little okay. hot, guys. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> On that note. way too hot in here. We got to wrap up, y'all. It's too hot. We are too parched. This could go on forever. This Jenna, our producer, fantastic. is telling us to wrap it up. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. We didn't get to say thank you. If you happen to be a parent or an adult person who was listening with a young person and you sent them out of the room, because we just ended on a very risque note. You can go get them and bring them back because the rest of the show is wholesome, we promise. So lastly, how can we forget the time that Heaven, a.k.a. Optimus Prime, reminded us of how great Zora Neale Hurston was in our Black History Clapback, where she breaks down for us how Zora was basically the OG of this carefree black girl shit. And she wrote real people, and she wrote them her way. Today's clapback is on behalf of and in the spirit of mm-hmm. my girl, Zora Neale Hurston. Yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with her, Tracy. <laughs> but I you think, insult me, madam. <laughs> but I think it's safe to say she's become a little more uh, integrated into like common Black History Month knowledge. Right. You know, right. like most people are taught about her, I think. Mm hmm. So now she's like a literary giant. She's Mm -hmm. in the canon, basically. But at the time that she was writing, she definitely was not. Mm. The thing about her, which I really, really love, is how unapologetic she was. Their Eyes Were Watching God has so much country dialect. Yes. Like, that was a big part of why people didn't like it. Like, Mm -hmm. respectable brown people were like, don't show us speaking in this way. We speak proper English. (laughs) The king's English. (laughs) Yeah. And she had, like, you know, a lot of colorful language. People are dancing. People are, you know, all the things that respectable Negroes do not enjoy. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Their Eyes Were Watching God is essentially a story about a woman who's, like, on a journey to find herself. It includes a lot about love and marriage and uh, what it means to grow with someone, but it's also definitely a story about Janie and the journey she's on. Mm-hmm. And it has one of the best opening quotes in uh, literary history. Which is? Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing until the watcher turns his eyes away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men. Now, women forget all those things they don't want to remember and remember everything they don't want to forget. The dream is the truth. Then they act and do things accordingly. That was beautiful. And I reread that. Read too. You sounded great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I reread that first like paragraph like a thousand times. Mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, <laughs> where is this going? <laughs> but anyways, I really like reading the book in high school, and I'm really glad it's become part of the canon because it was informative to me as well. Mm-hmm. But at the time, people did, like responded like, you know, snooty mm-hmm. <laughs> to it. Yeah, She had a lot of like tension with some of the 
Harlem Renaissance writers of the time or just some of the more, like I said, the respectable Negroes. Mm -hmm. The bougie ones. The bougie ones. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, they had um, this literary magazine called The New Negro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which, yes, of course, was like, it, it was started by Du Bois and, and company. Mm -hmm. And it really carries out an extension of his idea of the talented Tenth, mm -hmm. which is basically this idea that like the talented men of the race will carry us all for it, right. and of course it's men. <laughs> like, of course, of course. <laughs> but it's like there's a talented few that will carry the race. Mm -hmm. These race men will uphold us all. <laughs> so that's like their vision, and that's their like literary sensibilities. And she's like, "Yo, I'm just trying to write like a beautiful novel. Mm -hmm. I don't want about my actual life, <laughs> yes, and my black ass life, and what she I." She says she was interested in quote writing a novel and not a treatise on sociology. Damn, <laughs> she's like, "Yes, can I live? <laughs> can I just write about some dope brown people I grew up with <laughs> or something like that?" You know. Mm -hmm. She also said she's quote thoroughly sick of the race problem mm. <laughs> i feel like this is such a standard like black artist problem yeah you gotta write about everything we're all going through mm -hmm. or gotta be a good example when white people are watching exactly and you don't get to be like a regular individual human yeah it's tiring and she's also rare because she grew up in an all-black town post-reconstruction she grew up in Eatonville, florida and they had like a completely self-sustaining town really white people just passed by they weren't a part yeah. of it so she was used to like never having to be like, oh, now I got to answer all these questions about race. It's yeah. like, no, I'm writing a novel about love and finding yourself. One of my favorite quotes is from How It Feels to Be Colored Me when she talks about how she didn't even know she was black until she left Florida mm. and left like the incubation of like this beautiful black bubble she was in. Yeah. And then she got outside and she was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Yeah, she goes, I am not tragically colored. I do not weep at the world. I'm too busy sharpening my oyster knife. Mm. Mm. Beautiful, bloop, bloop. beautiful. Bloop, bloop, bloop. So she goes to Harlem as part of the Harlem Renaissance scene, but obviously feels a way about the new Negroes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she started her own collective and they called themselves the Niggerati. <laughs> what? <laughs> like very purposely trying to be like cheeky about. Uh-huh their literary sensibilities the niggerati <laughs> i never knew that oh my gosh so she had the idea to start her own literary magazine she said there needs to be quote more outlets for negro fire mm. <laughs> she's like i got the flames emoji for y'all <laughs> i got it so she started a literary magazine called fire two exclamation points mm. fire exclamation point exclamation <laughs> point and the motto was Tracy, I'm going to need you to help me on this because okay. you, know, you know I can't say I got any, you, I got you. anything in a country accent. <laughs> fire, fire, Lord. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> no one needs to hear this. Please say it. <laughs> Lord, that is so cute. <laughs> I can't say it. It sounds horrible. But that's the motto of the literary magazine. She's like, uh, I got the flames for y'all. So this I believe what we were going for is fire, fire, Lord. Yes. Love it. Yes. I got you. That is what I was going for. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, you're the cutest thing in the world. So, sadly, the, the magazine only lasted one issue because oh, of funding damn. issues. <laughs> and she was, like, off at school. And, you know, she was, like, doing anthropology with, like, the – with, like, Margaret – mead and like the founders of mm -hmm. modern anthropology so she's doing a lot of shit she's busy her whole life is the clap back there's mm -hmm. not one specific moment just her whole sensibility about it's that quote you say all the time that i love like i demand to be my full self in every space that i'm in right she did not apologize for that mm -hmm. and one of my favorite quotes all time in human history comes from her mm. from this essay what it feels like to be colored me she said sometimes i feel discriminated against but it does not make me angry it merely astonishes me. How can any deny themselves the pleasure of my company? It's beyond me. Blue. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I think that all the time. Like, how dare you? <laughs> You're, You're missing be out. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to my girl, Zora. Yes. It's so crazy that even though she's huge now, she died in obscurity. She was poor. The only reason we know of her is because Alice Walker went to her unmarked grave mm. and was like, we need to be talking about this woman. Mm. So shout out to black women holding each other down. Yes, Shout yes. out to Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker. There is um, a Zora Neale Hurston themed restaurant in D.C. called Eatonville. Yo. It's beautiful. We should go. Yeah, I'll go back. It's good. Shout out to Zora. Zora. It's beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> 
We did it. We did it. We did it. Yay. We hope that you enjoyed this All-Stars version of Another Round. I know that I enjoyed it because let me tell you, I have the worst memory in the world and I cannot remember half of the stuff and half of the conversations that we've had on this show. So this has been really, really good to jog my memory and be like, hey, you know what? This Another Round show. It's not bad. (laughs) People should listen to it sometimes. (laughs) So I'm glad that you guys listen to it still. Um, Hope you really, really enjoyed this episode. And if, like me, your goal is to read more, maybe it's a resolution. Maybe it's just a thing that you want to do for your Tuesday or your Wednesday or your Thursday. I hope that we gave you some really, really good spots to start. Update your reading list. Tell us what you're reading. Tell us what you want to read. Ask us what we're reading. Maybe I'll be reading something by that time and I'll have an answer for you. Um, tweet us, tweet us all of the book things at another round and make sure that you're subscribed to the newsletter because we are going to put links to all of the episodes that were featured in this episode in the newsletter. And we're going to have even more recommendations for other genres that we did not get to today. So there's too much goodness in the newsletter for you to not get it. If you want it and you don't have it yet, go to buzzfeed.com slash another round slash newsletter and get you some goodness. This episode was produced by the gregarious Shakita Pascal and the also gregarious Julia Farlin with production support from Meg Kramer and Nina Patek with editorial oversight from Eleanor Kagan. Yay! Shout out to our in-house musicians. Please follow the supremely talented Jean Grey on Twitter at Jean Greasy and the also supremely talented. I need more adjectives. Everybody is the same thing in these credits. I'm sorry. Don Will of the Almighty Tanya Morgan. You can follow him on Twitter at Don Will. You can follow me on Twitter um, at Broken McPoverty if you're in the mood for some questionable social media decisions. And you can follow Heaven on Twitter at Heaven Rants. That's Heaven like the place in the sky and Rants like the thing that people say Kanye does. And you know what? Sometimes he does. I'm going to say it. I agree. Sometimes he be ranting. You can send us an email at another round at buzzfeed.com. You can tweet us at another round. You can Facebook us at another round. We're pretty much another round on all of the social media things. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. You can do that at buzzfeed.com slash another round slash newsletter. Drink some water, take your meds, call your person, and read a book. I'm going to read a book too, right now. Bye. Did you see RuPaul's Drag Race last night? Of course I did. It blew my mind. It's all I ever talk about, and I can't find anybody to talk about it with, so I am so thankful that you're here. I mean, you have become my RuPaul's Drag Race soulmate, and I am thrilled that we have a new podcast at BuzzFeed called The Library, where this is all we talk about. Here, it truly is RuPaul's best friend race. (laughs) I could not agree with you more. So join us every Saturday as we recap the latest episode of Season 9 and gag over TV's best reality show. Tune in wherever you find your podcasts.